data warehouse applications uh, exist to provide uh, improved management information and reporting on potentially disparate systems. And in order to create the content of data warehouse applications, we use uh, processes typically called extract, transform, and load processes. We'll look at how we model and test these ETL uh, processes in this video. So firstly, I explain what uh, ETL processes actually are and introduce uh, an example, uh, a simplified uh, process used to extract data from uh, customer systems to provide a management reporting facility. And then we'll uh, look at the demo of ARD modeling uh, and testing the ETL process. And then I'll summarize at the end. Now, an ETL processes are in common use with uh, data warehousing applications. Uh, and the goal is to take data from potentially disparate sources and merge it, combine it, uh, enrich it, uh, and uh, rationalize it, if you like, in order to provide a reporting uh, facility uh, based on data that is consistent. Now, usually um, ETL processes are run uh, as batch uh, runs in order to uh, refresh the data in the data warehouse, perhaps overnight, uh, sometimes more often than an hour. ETL processes are often used in uh, migration projects where data in legacy systems might be transferred into uh, a new uh, revised and better uh, system to replace the legacy. Now in the process of mo moving the data, quite often the data itself needs a clean up, rationalization to fit a new data model. So ETL processes are often used with uh, data migration projects. The transform process is, is usually where the data is actually uh, improved, enriched, reconciled with uh, other data in, from other systems and so on. Now on the right you see like a, a generic ETL cycle where the, the cycle would be the process that runs perhaps overnight, every night to refresh the content of a data warehouse. So we have like an initiation, we'll build some reference data or download it or copy it into place. Then there's the extract from existing uh, data sources. Uh, sometimes there's a lot of validation required to uh, filter out all the uh, less accurate data that might have been entered in an, an unvalidated system, perhaps. Then the transformation is where the data is merged, deduplicated, cross-referenced with uh, reference data, aggregated or disaggregated, and then loaded into often a staging area, ready to be uh, loaded into the final tables. Quite often there's a, a need to track data that doesn't make it all the way through the process. So the cleaning uh, process might not be 100%. So quite often there are uh, audit reports or suspense files which hold data that can't be migrated through the process. Uh, certainly then the uh, data that might be in a staged area would then be published to the target tables and then perhaps there's an archive and clean up and, and so on. This is the generic uh, ETL kind of cycle that uh, we see again and again. Now, in order to demonstrate how ARD can support the testing of an ETL process, um, I need to introduce um, a kind of an example, a, a, a case study, which is uh, much simplified, but typical of the kind of processes that are actually in use. So in our example here, uh, the company want to normalize the data in an ordering system to uh, improve management reporting. So it's going to rationalize the data and to generate tables that can be better supporting of uh, the reporting. The three tables that we're extracting data from uh, comprise uh, some order detail, uh, the products against the orders, and the customers who place the orders. These three tables will be linked uh, with uh, unique references in the order, order table itself. Now, the uh, addresses in the uh, customer details and the addresses in the order details were never validated, so they were just free text, if you like. 
So the address data, we, we need to clean that up and match it against a postcode database to get accurate uh, address information. And once it's matched, it's codified, and then we have a more systematic way of capturing addresses in our new system or reporting on a geographic basis. Now, the addresses uh, are captured in two places, the customer record and the order record. Uh, the target data sets have been defined, and we've created a set of ETL business rules drawn up for the uh, processing and validation and matching and so on. So here are our three source tables, products, orders and customers, and the products are linked to the orders by a product ID and a customer ID links customers to the orders as well. We also have a postal address file, PATH if you like, uh, and the addresses in the orders and in the customer records will be matched against the postal address file. The output tables, which are generated from the content of the input tables and the, and the reference file, the path file, if you like, uh, we're going to generate a sales uh, database which contains all the order details and the tidied up uh, customer address IDs, which will be generated from the addresses that are going to be created as we encounter them in the customer and uh, order uh, records. Now those records that have uh, no order ID or product ID information in the sales uh, order record, uh, we're going to write into an order suspense file and these need some manual cleanup. The link between the sales record and addresses, we're going to have both the order address ID and a customer address ID. And these two addresses will be referenced Here's the process uh, in overview. We have the three input files plus the reference data in the path and the three output files, sales addresses, order suspense files. Now there are some business rules that have been drawn up to manage the uh, transformation process. And you can see if I walk through them quickly, um, firstly all orders have uh, to have a product ID and a customer ID to match and to look up product and customer information in the other two tables. Um, any orders with missing product or customer IDs will be written to uh, this suspense file, so they'll be analysed separately. The order quantity information will be stored in the uh, sales table when it's generated. Customer addresses and the order addresses will be matched with the uh, postal address file, and if a match is found, the address will be written to the addresses table if it doesn't already exist. And the uh, detail in the path file, the uh, full address details, will be referenced in the address table as it's generated. Now if an order doesn't have an address, uh, it'll use the customer address if one exists. Otherwise it'll be matched with the, uh, the path and a record written if necessary. Overall, unmatched addresses will be written to the addresses table with a false value for the validated address field. The validated address field will be true for valid addresses, if you like. Now, the overall strategy for testing an ETL process that we adopt with uh, Agile Requirements Designer is we will model the process of validation and table generation and take advantage of uh, the data builder facility to support the testing. What we'll do is we'll, we'll create a model of the process and include in that model processes, activities to create the data in both the source tables and in the target tables to be generated. So Data Builder can be used to actually generate all the content of the tables from the perspective of the input and the output. So what we can then do is take the data generated for the input files, run it through the actual process, ETL process itself, and then compare the outcome of the ETL process with the generated uh, output tables from uh, ARD. Now, the way we do the comparison might vary. I mean, if the output is a CSV file, it might be a simple text comparison. But if the data is written to a table, Certainly, we'll have to build some uh, simple queries to do a row-by-row -row comparison of the output from the process and the output from the ARD modelling exercise. 
Now in the demonstration we'll model the uh, ETL process but we're not going to show how Data Builder is actually used. I'm just going to suggest this is these are the places where Data Builder comes into its own. But the process of modeling is what I want to uh, show. Now, what you'll see when we get started with the demonstration, you'll suddenly realize actually an ETL process is just another process managing data. So the modeling activity is very straightforward, it's very simple uh, and similar to the way we've done uh, GUIs, for example, and uh, the decision tables in other videos. When an ETL process is actually designed, we usually find that the business rules need to be checked and tested on paper before the process is built. So I'm going to uh, create the model, but as I create it, I'm actually going to suggest that there are additional rules that need to be applied that weren't in our list uh, a couple of slides ago. Uh, but when you do this for real, you'd create your model from the rules given from the user community, and then having created your model, you can then feed back what the model is telling them in terms of paths through it. But you can also introduce concepts such as, well, what, what happens when we create a, um, a record and then another record that is duplicated? Do we have to do a lookup first and then create if it doesn't exist already? We have to add these kind of checks into our uh, uh, ETL process to make it work smoothly and not end up with lots of duplicated data. So as you've seen in other uh, videos and the models that I've shown you, uh, creating the model gives stakeholders a, a visualization of the process. So it can help us to find problems in the actual original requirement. There's no question that when people start on these kind of processes, they don't think through everything because they simply can't uh, anticipate all the actual uh, physical data management activities that the ETL process has to perform. So here we are in uh, Agile Requirements Designer again, and I'll open up the ETL process model that I created earlier. This is the whole model end to end. Um, and I just want to make a point out the color scheme just before we uh, get into the detail. Firstly, at the top of the model, you'll see uh, an orange process and at the bottom, you'll see a, another process. These are a header and a footer. Uh, process. Now these are there to support the data builder uh, integration with the tool. So uh, in effect the header sets up the configuration of data builder ready to go uh, with later activities in the model. The second colour I want to uh, highlight are the green uh, activities or processes here you can see. And these are where data is written uh, to the either input tables or output tables by the model itself. So this is where Data Builder does its magic and generate uh, the input test data or the expected results. All the rest of the elements, the purple elements, are the decision making and activities within the ETL process that we're modeling. So let's zoom in and start at the beginning and just walk through it. So there we have our start element. Uh, the header process, which is just there for the data builder integration. And the first check that's happening for every uh, order record is, uh, is the product ID available? If there's no product ID, we write uh, a record to the suspense file, uh, identifying that order as something that needs attention. Uh, we come through if the product ID is OK or, or whether there's a suspense record. We look at customer ID. Customer ID is the same process, is there one? If there isn't a customer ID, there can't be a match. So again, write that order to the suspense record and that'll be looked at later on. Next, we look at uh, the address match for the customer record. And if there's no PAF match, the uh, a variable validated customer address is false. Uh, if there is a match, okay, we know there's a record in the uh, uh, path that we can look up for this address, so we set the validated customer address to be true. So this is a piece of data that will be used a little bit later on when we start writing uh, address records into the addresses table. Now, if we find the uh, customer address in the database already, we'll use the matched address ID. If this address is new to our 
uh, database, we'll write that new record into the customer address file. So now we look at the uh, order address. If the address in the order record exists, uh, we then look for it in the uh, address table. If it doesn't exist, we are going to use the customer address that we've already done a match for and uh, checked. And we'll take that path further down uh, the model. So going back to the order address, we look for it in the uh, path. If there's no path match, we set the validated order address uh, as false. If there is a match, we set it to be true. Next, we look for that address in the address database. If there's a match already, so we've already written this address, we don't want a duplicate, so we reuse the matched address ID. If the address is not found in the addresses uh, table, we are going to write a new record there. Regardless, and this is the path from the reuse of the customer address, if you remember, regardless, we then write a sales record then we write the order record. You might remember from the uh, top of the model that we checked the product ID and customer ID. So we have these uh, second checks here to keep uh, the model uh, coherent. Um, so if, we, if we have the uh, product ID, we'll write a product record. If we don't have the product ID, we will drop down to the got customer ID check here. If we've got the customer ID, we write a customer record. Otherwise, we drop straight down to the footer. And then that's the end of the process. So you can see the process end to end is quite substantial. But uh, it's not a complex model, except it's rather long winded. Before we complete the model, um, I need to add some constraints uh, to keep it consistent. So you might recall at the start of the uh, process, we check for a product ID. And if there's no product ID, you know, we write a, a suspense record for, for the order. Well, uh, later on, we're going to write a product record if there is a product record to write. So we need to have a constraint to make sure that we don't accidentally uh, write a product record with no product ID. So we have uh, two links which uh, can't occur together. So I'm going to say if there's no product ID, I should not be writing a product record. So that should not exist. There's the top again. If there is no customer ID, we should not be writing a customer record. Now the second couple of uh, constraints are where we do have a product ID. We want these to drive the generation of a product record. So if we have a product ID or the condition item, you see down here, we want to write a product record. So you can see if there's a product ID, okay, then got product ID is true, so we write a product record. Create that constraint. And let's do the same for the customer ID. So here, must occur together, if we have a customer ID, then we must write a customer record. So that's it, that's our four constraints which ensure that the model hangs together okay. Now, let's look at Path Explorer and what I'm going to do is just go straight in and look at all possible paths. And we get 48. Now 48 uh, seems like quite a lot, but if you think about it, the ETL process is, 
is going to be dealing with many, many records, possibly millions of records. So all possible paths, if the uh, number of paths is uh, within a reasonable bound, um, we would normally use that as the target uh, optimization for uh, an ETL process. You should realize by now that when we're creating uh, this model with the uh, green activities which actually write the data to either the input records for testing or the output records for uh, our expected results, uh, the whole process is automated. So actually it's uh, quite a good thing to look at all possible paths and we can guarantee uh, the coverage that we uh, apply is going to be uh, very sound indeed. So one last thing, uh, let's look at the test data that can be generated. I've already uh, taken the default values and you can see in here the values for all the records that will be either written to the input records or the output records as expected results. Now those records don't have sufficient data in order to be coherent yet. So we'd have to actually add extra fields uh, and uh, values for those fields to generate, for example, uh, randomized customer names. Now that's one of the uh, benefits of Data Builder, which it can do that. So one last thing to, to show you, if we look at one of the green uh, activities on the model, you can see that there is a Data Builder tab in the properties box. And this is where we can create the configurations for the uh, publishing of data. So this is where the configuration of the uh, publishing of the input data tables or the output data tables, it's where it's done. So uh, when it comes to using uh, ARD to model an ETL process, you have complete control over how the uh, input data is generated and the expected results, the output data, is generated too. So, um, to summarise, uh, I hope you've seen how Agile Requirements Designer can be used to model uh, an ETL process for the purpose of testing. But just to remind you, by modelling we create a visual representation of the uh, ETL process that we can share with stakeholders. Now what we know from these kind of projects is that the requirements to deal with the data in uh, typically legacy systems uh, tend not to be a complete set. So we usually need to work with the stakeholders a bit more closely with the model itself to walk through the paths that uh, for the scenarios that they've defined. But it's usually the case that there are other rules that have to be added to deal with management of the data and the integrity of the target database. So by creating a covering set of paths, we can walk through the user's uh, initial ideas of scenarios to cover uh, and explore the less obvious paths to create a model that uh, is trusted to do the job. Now, to test the ETL process, we can use the Data Builder feature to generate both the test case data for the input records and the output records which represent the expected result. So by doing so, we can test the ETL process by using the generated input data and compare the output from the ETL process with our prepared output data created by Data Builder. 